Good afternoon. It has been a wild week. Not a good one in many ways. We have a, a huge world issue and we need to be attentive to that and saying prayers and thinking what can we do. Um, I, I listen to the late news usually almost every day, but Friday I like Channel 8 because Adam Chodak is always has a thought um, that he develops and speaks of. And this week he talked about Ukraine and he happened to be in his vet's office on Friday and everyone was rather beside themselves and thinking, what can we do, what can we do? And finally at the end of the discussion, people said basically what we can do is go on with life, which is what we must do. But one of the things he added to that was that we need to be kind and loving and gentle with our fellow Americans. Um, division is something that Putin very much wants from us, and so we must think differently about that. So we need to go about our business, and we need to be kind and gentle to all of the people that we encounter. <clears throat> we will be... Um, I believe Sue has already put a, a prayer up on social media from us, and we will continue to be attentive as we can to this issue. Um, if there are other things that you think of, um, I'm sure there are lots of places that will take donations. There is, Rochester is a, um, a very uh, sort of worldly place, and we have many refugees and people from different countries. And there is a fairly strong Ukrainian um, group within the Rochester area, and I'm sure that they would be accepting donations or um, whatever. The other things, I think the large things like Doctors Without Borders and care and stuff like that, because people are being killed and injured and there's just tons and tons of need out there. So we need to be very, very attentive to that. I do have a bit of good news that I think was, it really meant a lot to me. I used to be um, a, a part of a lot of anti-poverty things that were going on in Rochester. Currently, there's an organization called Rochester Monroe Anti-Poverty Institute. And I get a newsletter from them, and one of the things that they talked about this week on the newsletter was that they had set a goal um, for 2021 for at least 10,000 people in the inner city of Rochester to be making $15 an hour as a base wage. Now, if you know anything about Rochester, uh, inner city Rochester is one of the worst areas of poverty in the country. So this was kind of a major thing, a very specific goal that they could look at and see if it was achieved. And indeed, um, not just 10,000 people ended up making $15 an hour as a base wage, but over 11,000. So that was really, really good news. Now I know that that's an issue that isn't the, the same for every person, but it does begin to help people to step out or a little bit away from poverty. So I wanted to share that good news with you because we need a little bit of good news for this week. The flowers today are from Sherry and they're lovely. There's no specific reason they're here except that they're lovely and they give us joy and that's really wonderful. Um, we will be continuing to mask while singing. Um, our calendar for the week, um, Circle of Friends is back, school is back in session this week. Um, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday and we are going to be carpooling and going to Churchville for their seven o'clock in the evening service. And Lauren and Pam and myself have 
are willing to drive if any of you trust us. Um, so we can meet at the, here at, at the church. Um, I think it'll take us at least a half an hour to get there. So uh, at 6.30, shall we set that as a time for meeting here? Yeah. Um, midweek meditation is also on Wednesday, and Bible study was listed on the um, newsletter, um, but I think probably we should not have Bible study and encourage people to participate in the Ash Wednesday service. Friday is trustees. It's a Zoom meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and Friday is also the World Day of Prayer. So we have, I, I think every day from now on has to be a World Day of Prayer, but that specifically. And World Day of Prayer was actually originally um, developed and encouraged by women. And so it's very much a, uh, a, a women-initiated thing, but everyone's welcome. Um, a couple of things I'm going to put up on the bulletin board. Uh, one is a presentation that the Hilton Baptist Church is doing on March 20th um, on life decisions in retirement. It's only an hour long, um, but I'll put that up if anybody's interested in that. And also the Genesee Valley Association, um, half of the budget, half of the money that they receive goes toward um, grants for nonprofit organizations. And so there's an application process, and it's open and beginning. So if you think of anyone that you know, might be needing that, it's not just for UCC churches, really. It's for organizations that do good things in the community. Um, and today, if you look at the back of your bulletin, is Seminary Sunday and Church Vocations Sunday. So take a look at the back of your bulletin. Are there any other announcements or things I should bring up? I've taken half of Bradley's time now. Um, food shelf needs a continued personal care items. If you look at your newsletter, Tina put in a really interesting thing that's sort of an upside down Lenten thing. So instead of giving something up, you give something. So a toothbrush or a can of pineapple or something like that. And she has something listed for each day. So we should, if we all did that, we'd have quite a collection at the end of the, at the end of Lent. Okay. Remember if you need pastoral support, contact Pastor Bradley directly. It is our hope that this service of worship and the weekly meditations and our prayers provide you with some comfort and stability in this time of great uncertainty. Parma Greece, United Church of Christ, sharing God's love wherever we are. And now let us prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits for worship. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I get into uh, worship, I do want to plug the service uh, on Ash Wednesday at Churchville. Uh, during the season of Lent, I'm going to be preaching a series on prayer. And the first uh, installment of that series will be on Ash Wednesday. So at, we're going to stream the service. So if you, if you don't want to come, at least think about watching uh, you know, online whether it's you know, at, at, the, at the moment or, or after, once it's posted. It'll be uh, posted on both Churchville's page and on our page once it's over. Uh, but please do think about coming out. 
I think it'll be a good time. We're going to do the, the, the disposition of ashes, which we haven't been able to do because of COVID. Uh, hope to see some of you there. Let's go ahead and get into worship now. Join me in our call to worship. We have seen the light of God. We have seen the light of God. We have seen the light of God. There can be no doubt. Amen. Let us worship together. Our opening hymn now is number 237 in the garden. come now to the blessing of our gifts. We take a minute every Sunday and acknowledge and thank everyone who's continued to be faithful to your pledges and commitments. Without you, this place is an empty building. It's a meaningless name, right? But because of you, because of your donations and your contributions of your time and your energy and your talents and your expertise, and your monies, and, and anything else that I'm not including on this list. You make this place be a place that is full of life and of love. You make this be a place where people can come to be set free. And that's because of you. So thank you. Your gifts are seen. They're seen by me and by Christ. So let's take a moment now and bless all of those gifts. In the giving of our gifts, we live into the unconditional love of God. May our gifts bring hope for those around us who are in despair. May they extend the love of God to everyone they touch. Receive our gifts, O God, and bless them, we pray. May they speed the coming of your kingdom in our community. Amen.
Jesus meets us here, raising us from the depths of the valley to the heights of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. Let us worship him from the mountain. And here again, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Let us hear those words calling us to life eternal, to agency in God's kingdom. Let us ourselves be transfigured, made to be light in the darkness, beacons of hope sent to bring light to the nations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising, born of heaven, and reaching out to each one of us, a light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all of who we are, a light that transfigures the world. Through your light, transform our darkness into hope. Bring us life from an intersection of heaven with earth, where old life ends and new life is born. Amen. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the Hebrew scriptures today are ex is from Exodus 34, verses 29 through 35. The shining face of Moses. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, but whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. The, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. For the word in, of God in Scripture. Thanks be to God. The epistle, epistle lesson today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as, through, as, through, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. For the word of God among us. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Our reading now from the Gospel. I'm reading from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 28. And it's a bit of a lengthy passage today because we're going to read uh, the whole account of the Transfiguration from the moment they're on the mountain to the moment they come down. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James. 
and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain... A great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father, and all were astounded at the greatness of God. For the word of God within us, My friends, Ryan and Rose, got married recently. The wedding took place last summer, summer 2021. It was a destination wedding at a tropical location in the Caribbean on a beach. The sound of the waves gently lapping against the sand, a light, cool breeze sweeping in from the ocean. They had waited until after the heat of the day to do the ceremony, so by then, the place was all but deserted, except for them, a few close family members, a photographer, and a pastor. Everyone was dressed for a wedding. Ryan was wearing a very clean-looking linen suit that he'd had custom-made, so dapper, but also light enough so that he wasn't sweating on the beach. Parents wore flowing shirts or dresses. The pastor, of course, was sweating profusely in his woolen suit, tugging at his collar. Are we uh, missing anyone? Ah, yes, the bride, Rose. Ryan and Rose had honored the tradition that the groom does not see the bride the day of the wedding until the moment that she comes into the back of the church. But this uh, being a beach, there's no back of the church. So what they had done was arrange with uh, the local authorities permission to drive a car onto the beach out to where the ceremony was, was being done. There they are then. These few people gathered in this beautiful and serene location for this blissful moment and they were ready. Up drives the car, and then out steps Rose. She wore a fitted white dress of linen and silk that was cut modestly, but also appropriate for the beach. She looked beautiful, more beautiful than Ryan had ever seen her look. At the sight of her, he wept tears of joy. He wept because her beauty was overwhelming to him. He wept because in that moment, he was more sure and certain 
of her and of his love for her than anything he'd ever felt certain about before. He wept because in a few moments, this amazing, incredible woman was going to give herself to him. A gift that could never be repaid by any stretch of the imagination. But he knew that he would have the rest of his life to try. A wedding like this shows us, gives us a glimpse into what it probably felt like to be there when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. What it was like to be there on top of the mountain that day. Now, as I was talking about the wedding, were you picturing it? Could you hear the sounds? Could you see the sights? Could you feel some of the feelings? Now, what let's do is let's take those sights and sounds and emotions and apply them to the story of the transfiguration. I think it'll be helpful. Away from the great crowds and the hustle and bustle of daily life, away from the demands of ministry and the constant conflicts that were always surrounding them, Jesus, Peter, James, and John stood atop a high but climbable mountain. They were gathered there, feeling the cool air that one feels at altitude, looking out over the land to see the spectacular mountain views, hearing the sweet sounds of silence. The disciples were praying quietly between themselves and God, as they often did in moments of solitude like this one, when all of a sudden, A radiant beauty transfixed them. Their Lord and their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus, had somehow, don't know how to say it, but he'd become a different man. The the appearance of his face changed. They knew, the disciples did, that this was Jesus, but the visage before them was also not the Jesus they knew. Somehow, he'd taken on the specter of heaven. His clothes glowed a dazzling white with so profound a whiteness that their own clothing looked blackish and dull. Even the once spectacular mountain views paled in comparison to the heavenly beauty, the glory, and the splendor before their very eyes. Peter, James, and John were enraptured by what they were seeing and hearing. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, the revelation of the glory of God. The voice from heaven, though, when it came, proved to be a little too much for them. That pushed them over from being overwhelmed into being terrified. But do we know what they were feeling overall before that moment? where they kind of (laughs) had taken all that they can take? Sure we do. They wept tears of joy. They wept because the beauty of heaven was entirely overwhelming. They wept because they were more certain in that moment of the reality of God and the grace and truth of Jesus Christ than of anything they'd ever felt certain of before. They wept because they'd been allowed to see a sight that men are not permitted to see this side of the veil. And they knew that they'd been given an indescribable and priceless gift that they could never even possibly begin to repay, but also that they'd have the rest of their lives to try. Ah, the beautiful wedding the glorious transfiguration, the mountaintop, the beach, all so serene, so surreal, so perfect. Understandably, Ryan and Rose wanted to stay for a while, and they did. They spent two weeks in the Caribbean on a wonderful honeymoon. Peter, James, and John wanted to stay too. Peter suggested they put up tents, 
so everyone could stick around. But whether it's a day later or two weeks later or a month later, eventually we have to come back. We have to return to work and school and family. We have to return to brave the winter's cold. Somehow it stings worse after a tropical vacation, doesn't it? We have to leave the Caribbean behind. We have to come down from atop the mountain. We have to face the pressures that are present in our lives. Ryan and Rose returned to a blizzard of problems at work and at home. Ryan, unbeknownst to him, had almost lost his job while he was away because someone at work took issue with the paperwork that he'd filed for his time off. And on the day they got home, they weren't even home one day before his phone is, bl is blowing up and he has to go into work and deal with this. That same day. Rose, she's a teacher, she found herself absolutely in the weeds with her prep for the start of school. And she had to scramble madly to be ready in time. And that was very stressful for her. Now, the same thing that happened to Ryan and Rose here also happened to Jesus. The text says that on the next day when they had come down, a great crowd met him. A crowd of people moaning and groaning for food and shelter and water. A crowd of people crying for relief from their many ailments. A crowd of people whose visible and audible conflict and strife marred the beauty and the serenity and the certainty that he'd experienced just hours prior. Jesus then sees these sights and hears these sounds, and then he names them. He names them faithless and perverse. Remember, we, we read that. Faithless because the conflicts and the worries and the pressures and the problems that we face in our homes and workplaces and communities, they make it very, very difficult to recall, even recall, much less consistently feel the certainty that was with them at the top of the mountain. That same certainty that Ryan felt when he saw Rose step out of the car. It was gone. All gone. The serenity, the tears of joy, they were memories now. Um, the next day, the day that the honeymoon was over. So Jesus says, faithless. And he also says perverse. He says perverse because the strife and the conflict that have a way of grabbing us and confronting us and, and threatening to consume us, so powerful are they. These things are so painfully destructive of the heavenly perfection, the utter beauty that overwhelmed us back on top of the mountain or on the beach. Zoom out with me a little and, and see, see the point that, that I'm making here. Now, we're all created in the image of God, yes? We have something of the divine in us that gives us life, right? And, and we're given this world that we could have made into anything that we wanted, yes? Kind of a blank slate, if you will. We could have a virtual paradise here, but we don't, do we? We have instead poverty and racism and war, constant war. So we have these negative things, these painful, destructive things that shape life here like violence and economic exploitation and death. And what they have the effect of doing is distorting what life was meant to be. 
They distort it, they twist it. The real reality, what life was meant to be, is what the kingdom of God would be like fully realized on the earth. Love for self and neighbor. Provision for all. None none of these major problems. But they're twisted now. They're perverted. So Jesus says, perverse. Jesus names faithlessness and perversion and then expresses the frustration with them that each and all of us share. I know that you've felt this as have I. I feel it more and more recently. I think we know this feeling all too well. He says, how much longer do I have to be here? How much longer do I have to put up with this? For us, as for Jesus, the answer is for the duration of our natural lives. And that's true. And that truth leaves us really no choice. We have to figure it out. We have to figure out how to cope with faithlessness and perversion by any means necessary, by trial and error, if that's what it comes to, because those things have the capacity to destroy us spiritually. Ryan and Rose found themselves under so much stress and so much pressure so, so quickly, you know, the moment they returned home from their honeymoon, that the bliss of that time all but gave way within just a few short days to the angst of their first fight as a married couple the first of what will be many disagreements and misunderstandings. We all know why, right? Living with someone is hard enough on its own. The, the, the push and the pull of that, the give and the take, it's hard to balance it. It causes conflict. But then throw in the worries and the pressures of life and maybe a couple of children. And what you've got there is a recipe for constant and detrimental conflict if you're not careful. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? This is, this is true to life. Okay. So what they've got to do then is they have to work at it. Marriage is work, yeah? This is why. Because if they don't work at it, the faithlessness and the perversion that assail their, their perfect love, their beautiful love, If they don't cope with it, they're going to lose that love. And that's the reality. In the same way, it takes work. It takes an expenditure of energy and effort for us to remember those moments that we were sure, that we absolutely knew It takes work to remember that amid so many moments when we just don't anymore. It takes work to cope with this twisted up way of being and functioning that we have to face here. It takes work and effort to develop and protect and possess these streams of living water that would well up in us to eternal life. Because it's like we're wandering through this desert whose heat will dry up that oasis if we're not careful. If we don't work at it, if we don't continue to work at it, just like Ryan and Rose have to do, and figure out how to deal together with faithlessness and perversion, these things that assail the certainty and the beauty of God's love among us. We could lose it. But I have good news. People of God, we can do it. Somebody smile at me. I'm telling the truth now. People of God, we can do this. We can overcome the world just as our Lord and Savior has done. We can hang on to and even grow 
and develop within us and among us the perfect love of God and the beauty of life in the kingdom of God right here and right now it has been given to us to do that. It's been put within our reach. It is well within our grasp to do these things. We can keep these springs of living water flowing within us, come what may. When the storms of life assail you, do like the psalm says, be still and know. Know that what you saw and what you knew atop the mountain remains just as true in those moments where you're not certain as it was then. It didn't change. Be still and know. And remember. Remember those moments when the things of earth grew strangely dim in the light of God's glory and grace. When the majesty and the beauty of God's love flooded your heart and overwhelmed you. Remember the tears of joy, the tears of relief, those precious moments when you could finally breathe. Remember that God's love remains always and forever, despite what we feel, despite what we see, that God's love remains just as potent with you the next day the day the honeymoon is over. Amen. Thanks be to God. For our homily hymn, we have number 182, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding. Come now to the prayers of the people. The Lord be with you. Prayers for Kathy, who is under a lot of stress. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Nick and Sarah, who are also under a lot of stress. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Bill. Lord, in your mercy. 
prayers for Dick, who is dealing with some health issues. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Bob, who's also dealing with some health issues. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers of joy for Lori's 94th birthday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers of joy. I want to take a moment now and pray with you for the crisis in Ukraine. We had talked about me posting a prayer on Facebook for Ukraine, and I couldn't come up with one. I'll be honest. I stumped him. What I preach today is relevant to this. Because scripture tells us and experience sometimes reminds us that God is really God. That God is in control. That God loves and cares and intervenes. But then you look at what's happening in Ukraine and you think, how in the world can that be true? God doesn't need our help to be God. God doesn't need reminding that people are dying. God doesn't need reminding that we want peace. But we do. So the prayer I'd like to lead us in for today is really for us. And I'll lift up some prayers also for what's going on over there. But I want you to grab a hold of these words and let your faith be strengthened by them. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we wish many times that we could see what you see that we could understand what is really going on. That we could see through things the way that you do. That we could see the whole board the way that you do. But we can't. Your mind is so much greater than ours. Your ways so far above ours. All we can do is trust you. And right now, that's hard. We pray that according to the gentleness and the kindness of your incredible love for us, that you would remind us that you indeed are God, that you hold the earth in the the palm of your hand, that you indeed are sovereign over history, that you remain in control, that your will is not thwarted. Grant us confidence of that. Again, we pray. We pray further that your will would be done in the Ukraine, and we know right now that it's not. We pray that love would win that love would conquer the violence there. We pray that peace would prevail, that you would speak peace to that storm and that it would be still. Intervene, Lord, we pray. Prayers for everyone who has lost life and loved ones and property and freedom. prayers, Lord, for your love and your peace to overwhelm them, for you to remind them that there is beauty, that that there is love, and that it's found in you. If, If there is something that we can do from way over here, from our positions of relative powerlessness. If there's something we can do to help, pray that you would move us to help, that you would open our eyes to see it and move us to do it. And in all things, Lord, may your love be strong and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now we pray together with 
the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn now. Uh, this is the one we do on all the Sundays of the month that are not the first one. Number 77, Lord dismiss us with your blessing, verses 1 and 3. Please remain standing now in body or spirit for our benediction. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. Now our service is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God.